Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, San Francisco's premier author interview program. And today we are joined by a very successful writer of thrillers. His name is Barry Eisler, and his new book is called Fault Line, and it's published by Ballantine Books. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you, Jim. It's good to be here. You know, uh, when I when I look at your jacket flap, you know, it, it screams very, very accomplished author, best-selling thrillers, won awards like the Barry Award, the Gumshoe Award, the best thriller of the year, and you've been on numerous best of lists. But the most outstanding achievement in that list, as far as I'm concerned, is that you, among all the authors I've ever had, can say that a movie based on one of your books is actually going to be released next month. I mean, usually yeah. they come in and say, well, there was an option taken, and then they, they name some famous guy who's been looking at it and so forth. Right, right. And uh, so I want to congratulate you on that. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, nice. It's definitely a great thing for a book commercially to have a movie made oh, from it. Oh, golly fact, gee. Uh, my friend, the thriller writer Lee Child, once said that, uh, look, if someone makes a movie based on your books, it's, it means someone's going to do, it a, do a $40 million advertising campaign for your books. That can't hurt. Certainly a good thing. <laughs> it certainly is. One of the other things about uh, your is your relationship with uh, Sony Japan. Uh, you actually wrote a screenplay that I, I guess was kind of accepted, and then somebody by the name of Max Mannix uh, trumped your screenplay, so to speak. Um, I, yeah, I guess you could look at it that way. Um, I wrote, I adapted Rainfall, my first book. Uh, into a screenplay relatively early on in the process when a um, production company called Three Dogs and a Pony had optioned the rights. So I adapted the screenplay and said to them, look, uh, this will help get the movie made, right? And the answer is yes, because ultimately you need a screenplay. We didn't have one at that point. Right, right. So I said, use it. See if, uh, if you can use it to set up the movie, then uh, that'll be great. Eventually it'll mean a payday for me, and it'll mean we all get to see the movie, and that's what we want. Mm -hmm. If you don't like it, throw it away. Um, Three Dogs and a Pony... Uh, it seems like a pretty good deal, right? So they said, yeah, sure, go for it. They liked it. Ultimately, they did, in fact, sell the uh, screenplay to Sony. So Sony bought my screenplay. But the director they brought on board, Max Mannix, had his own vision for the movie and so decided to write his own screenplay, and that happens all the time. Uh, oh, absolutely. I can remember talking to James Elroy about that. Sure. And and uh, I, I said, so did you have a, a hand in the movie? And he said, no. They paid me the money. I <laughs> walk and if they call me, I answer the phone. <laughs> yeah, and I think I love uh, I love James Elroy's books, by the way, and he's, uh, uh, he's, he's, he's an amazing guy. He's but I think that's the right attitude. Um, you have to understand that, well, in this case specifically, the movie is very different from the book. So mm -hmm. I think of it as uh, it's a movie that was inspired by my book. Correct. And that's the way I try to look at it. But I think it's a mistake for an author who's not otherwise involved with the movie to get too emotionally attached to how the movie turns out because it's not it's not your thing it's not your movie the book was your book mm -hmm. but the movie is someone else's and it's important to remember that like like many of your uh, other books fault line i i suppose could be said to be a fast-paced thriller and but you yourself actually in in talking about it its start suggests that it, it really came into being as you were thinking about a pair of brothers, radically different, different right. in personality, temperament, and worldview. And believe me, that adds another dimension to the book, I think. I hope so. Thanks for saying so. Um, I'm, I'm never very interested in books that are heavily plot-driven, that, that are all about the ticking suitcase nuke or whatever. <laughs> uh, it's, and I think we're, we're, we're all this way. I mean, not that, not that those books don't serve a function. And uh, whatever you enjoy, you enjoy, and there's nothing wrong with it. But I... I think that in terms of the kind of books that affect you the most, that stay with you the longest, uh, those are all character-driven books. The ones that are heavily plot-driven maybe make the airplane ride go faster, but as soon as you're done with the book, you, really, you weren't really affected by it. You don't really remember it anymore. I so it's the characters and the relationships that always interest me the most. Not that I don't like to have a lot of action and exotic locales and steamy sex in my books. I like all that, too. But if it's not a character-driven, relationship-driven book, then uh, the rest of it doesn't work in my mind. There are, there are three characters, I, I would say, driving this, this book. Uh, one is Alex Trevin, mm -hmm. and, and he, in a, a kind of thumbnail sketch of him might be 
sacrificed everything to become partner in a high-tech law firm, and he's not quite there yet. That's right. And, and then he has a brother, a military liaison, undercover soldier, paid to find, fix, and finish high-value targets. I love that phrase, high-value targets. Yeah. <laughs> and he's really part of what, uh, in some other place, I, I think you or the publisher says, he's, he's in what's called black ops. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. if anyone, by the way, if anyone's curious about uh, what the older brother, Ben Trevin, really does, mm -hmm. Google that phrase, military liaison element, and see where it takes you. Uh, you'll see that men like Ben do, in fact, exist. You know, there is another important character in Fault Line. Yes. It's Obsidian, the world's most advanced encryption algorithm. Ah, I thought you were going to talk about Sarah. I thought you were going to talk about Sarah Hussein. I'll talk, talk about guys. her and Obsidian <laughs> when we come back. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Fault Line is the book. Barry Eisler is the author. The publisher is Ballantine Books. And it's, of course, received some advance praise by a personage no less than Ridley Pearson, author most recently of Killer View. He says an exciting, believable, and well-written thriller. Put Fault Line at the top of your reading list. I'm a new Barry Eisler fan. What took him so long? What's <laughs> the matter with him? Uh, uh, we're just achieving world domination one reader at a time. That's <laughs> uh, an honor to have. Uh, to oh, have yes, it is. Him. Yeah, yeah. No, he's too busy out promoting his own stuff. That's the problem. Now, <laughs> let's go back to our character count, if you will. And, and let's talk about Sarah Hosseini. Is that right. the way to say it? That's a, right. a young Iranian-American lawyer. And uh, what else is she? Um, she's involved with uh, the technology that's at the heart of the conspiracy in the novel. And uh, now she's conflicted about her, um, her role as an attorney. Is this really what's best for her? Um, she has certain, um, certain romance issues in her life. And uh, she's quite liberal politically, which all of which uh, makes her... Uh, a, a kind of oil to Ben's water. They they see the world differently. They have different personalities, different worldviews, different backgrounds, and uh, they immediately dislike each other when they meet and distrust each other. And yet there's this powerful sexual chemistry, and I love the way those opposing forces between those two characters play themselves out in the novel. Well, the other thing that's a big kind of opposing force, I think, is the fact that here are the three main characters, and they don't really like each other that much, you know? Not at all. I actually. mean, Alex uh, is yeah. very, very cool to, to Sarah, and, mm -hmm. you know, his relationship with his brother is like Cain and Abel. <laughs> yeah, that was, and that's the heart of the book for me. I mean, these two brothers are totally unlike. They can't stand each other. They haven't even spoken in seven years since their mother, their surviving parent, died of cancer. They want nothing to do with each other. But when Alex gets in trouble, uh, when the inventor he's representing is killed and then the patent examiner gets killed and then someone makes a run at Alex in his own house, Alex knows he's in trouble and the police can't help. And the only person he can think who might be able to help him is the last person he ever thought he would ask. And that's his big brother, Ben. And uh, when, uh, they, when they get together, they have this kind of conversation, if I may read from the book. This is Ben. You expect me to do the dirty work for you? Is that it? I don't. He stopped, unsure of what to say next. Ben laughed. You're just like the politicians, Alex. You want something done, but you won't let people do it right. You think you can pick up a turd from the clean end. That's a marvelous expression. It doesn't work that way. That, that, that's not what I'm... Yes, it is. I'm sick of liberals who never even see a gun, who've never even seen a gun let alone handled one under adrenal stress, trying to crucify cops for not shooting the knife out of the bad guy's hand, trying to prosecute soldiers who put an extra bullet into Ahmed after he goes down, never even thinking to ask whether it was that extra bullet that stopped the SOB from detonating an explosive vest. 
You can live in that fa- fantasy world if you want, but how about just a little bit of gratitude for the people who make it possible for you, who do all that dirty work so can, you can go on pretending you're clean. And that really draws the line between the two of them beyond their familial problems, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. They, they've got the familial problems and, uh, and again, the different politics, different worldviews. Uh, I love putting characters like that together. And yet, they can't just walk away from each other because blood is blood. There's an expression I really like, which is, home is the place where when you go there, they have to take you. Uh-huh. And that, to me, is the heart of this book. Yeah. No matter how much these guys can't stand each other, no matter how many, how much blame there is and the recriminations and their history and everything else, uh, when the chips are really down, they can seemingly rely on each other because they have to, which is a reasonably good definition of family, I guess. So I love putting these guys together. They hate each other, but they're going to help each other anyway. How's that going to turn out? That's what I want. Yeah. There, there is a phrase that, that you use, black ops. Is that, does that actually exist? Of course. Black Ops? It's just black, black Ops is, uh, I don't know, it's almost slang for covert operations. Oh, okay. And operations, yeah. All right, all right. And uh, one of the things that uh, Ben believes when he, at another part where he expounds on his philosophy, is that he, he believes in fighting dirty. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's really Black Ops, isn't it? Um. Absolutely, among other things. Yeah, Ben thinks that we're in a fight and we need to win it. Why are you trying to play by rules? The other side's not playing by rules. What's the purpose is to win the fight. We'll worry about, uh, we'll worry about whether we won cleanly or whatever afterwards. What does he say? He says, uh, he says we can have a victor's justice, but first we need the victory. And that's what he's about. Clearly, Fault Line is more than a great thriller. It makes you think about things like this country's security, and also something really way out there, like like giving government intelligence a profit motive? Stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC, or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. This is Jim Foster. It is Conversations on the Coast, Fault Line. A novel by Barry Eisler is what we've been talking about. And uh, another fair country uh, writer, Joseph Finder, author of Power Play, had this to say about Fault Line. Thriller fans already know that Barry Eisler is one of the brightest stars out there. But now with Fault Line, a breathlessly exciting, lightning-paced, and moving tale of suspense, I predict a whole lot more readers are going to discover how terrific he is. And is that what, I guess, publishers hope to accomplish when the writer is asked or decides to write what they call a standalone? Uh, well, I think it's, it's, what writer, it's what publishers want with any book. They, they want it to be discovered uh, by new readers in addition to being lapped up by the existing audience. Yeah. That was, mm-hmm. again, another honor. Um, Joe is a terrific writer. I loved his book, Company Man. It just... Uh, it's a cliche to say you can't put it down, but I could not put that book down. It was amazingly oh. suspenseful. Nice. Terrific book. Nice, uh, nice, nice for him to come on board for you. Yeah, it was nice of him, and as I said, it's an honor to have him uh, to include him as a uh, one of my readers to count him as one of my readers. So yeah, uh, the standalone after you've written a six book series, as I have, uh, with maybe more to come in that series about the half assa- half American, half Japanese assassin John Rain. Mm-hmm. Uh, writing a standalone, I guess, is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, people who really like the Rain books might be reluctant to try something new. And I know Robert Parker went through this when he went from Spencer to Jesse Stone. Mm-hmm. On mm-hmm. the other hand, people who've heard good things about me but who maybe don't want to read all the Rain books, it seems daunting to think, wow, it's, there are already six of these books. Do I really want to get involved in that? Then they, oh, well, this is a standalone. I've heard good things about the author. Maybe I'll give the standalone a try. I'm not sure exactly how it works out commercially in the end, but what I do know is that if you if you are passionate about a story or an idea you have, I think write it, write the best book you can, and uh, worry a little bit about less about the commerce. Uh, worry worry about the commerce later. And that's really? how I tried to do it with Fault Line. I, I I think that's that's an excellent way to look at it. Really good. That's yeah, worked so far. Okay. 
Uh, you, but you are fascinated with assassins. I mean, after all, Ben is an assassin too. Yeah, I do see. So at this point, I think we can we can say we're past the point where I could credibly claim that it's all a coincidence. <laughs> I've, just, I've always been interested in uh, the uh, the secret world and forbidden knowledge. I spent three years in a covert position in the CIA, and uh, and so it's not a coincidence that some of the, the some of the characters I write anyway are assassins or spies or undercover military guys and that sort of thing. And it's fun for me to create those characters in part because I get to draw on some of my own training and experience. Fault Line was particularly fun for me to write because I got to draw not just on the CIA background, but also on my time as a Silicon Valley technology lawyer and as an executive in a Silicon Valley venture finance technology company. And you, and you seem to have that part down, Pat. That, well, thanks. Uh, I get a I get a decent amount of email from lawyers um, about this book, saying, "Man, you you clearly have worked in a big firm." Oh, great! That's nice to hear too. That's great. The, under, That's the, great. Uh, the world of actual assassins and of uh, law firm assassins. <laughs> what a group! <laughs> <laughs> as far as the CIA is concerned, you you've made some comments that that are not entirely kind. Uh, you write that when you look at the history of CIA clandestine activities, regime change in Iran, assassination plots against Castro, right. and stuff like that, the record isn't isn't too good. And I don't I don't think it is. Yeah. Yeah, and this is where we get into the profit note. It's yeah. fair to ask, you say, how different things might be if the CIA hadn't existed to begin with, a public corporation. Right. would look at all the money we spend on intelligence and ask, what are we getting for it? Of course. And whether we can get the same for less. This is an interesting concept. Yeah, it's something that uh, we need a lot more of in the government, but there's an attitude among policymakers that if something isn't stamped top secret or doesn't appear in the president's daily brief or whatever, yeah. that it's not really valuable. But I think actually... Um, for the price of about a $200 a year subscription to The Economist, policymakers could get pretty much most of the open source information they need to, uh, to design intelligent policy toward major countries like China, Russia, etc. And that would leave the spooks to focus much more on tactical questions, which could become quite important to us, such as, for example, the location of Pakistan's nuclear weapons if for some reason Pakistan really uh, goes under we might want to send commandos, special ops people in there to try to secure those nukes. Just one possibility. So um, instead of worrying so much about all the strategic possibilities with China, for which you don't need secret information, everything you need to know to design policy toward China is publicly available, we could focus, we could refocus on the much more important things that can only be, uh, information that can only be gained through covert methods. And that's, that's my point in, uh, in criticizing the CIA. It's not just the CIA. It's, uh, it's a misunderstanding of the value and use of intelligent, uh, intelligence at the policy level, in my opinion. One, one, one final question before we have to wind this up. Are we going to hear more about characters like Sarah and Ben and Alex? In future books? Yes. Well, the next book is a sequel to Fault Line. And uh, I think, yes, I feel confident in saying that you will hear at least a bit from all three of them, although Fault Line, or the sequel rather, seems to be driven so far more by Ben than the other two. Don't wait for the sequel. Get to Fault Line now. Meet these wonderful characters. The author of Fault Line is Barry Eisler. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster C-O-C. Or send an email to jimfostercoc at gmail.com.